All right, so this week we are going to, we're going to do the next two weeks on contract law. Um, it's one of, I think, the more useful and interesting topics that we'll cover, um, but I think useful for you in practical terms as well. So I hope you'll get something out of that. The way we're going to set it up is I'm going to lecture today. Thursday, we'll talk about cases and some um, fact pattern examples, and then we'll do the same thing next week. You're only going to have one quiz for this unit, and it won't be due till after week two. So you don't have any quizzes due this week. Uh, you do have a discussion question this week, and I'll probably do another discussion question next week, so make sure you pay attention to those. But the quiz is not due for two weeks. There's no assignment this week. Um, Anybody have any questions on anything so far? All right, good deal. So a couple of, uh, before we get too deep into contracts, I want to talk about some couple of overarching principles of contract law that, um, that I want to kind of lay out. One is that uh, a contract, in order to be enforceable, does not have to be in writing. Not all contracts have to be in writing to be enforceable. Some do. The law does require like real estate contracts and some other contracts to be in writing. But not all of them do. And that's a common misconception sometimes from students is, well, if it's not in writing, then it's not a contract. Not necessarily true. The second kind of overall, well, let me go back to that for a second. That being said, you should always, always, always get in writing whatever it is that you're agreeing to with somebody. The more you have in writing, the better you'll be able to protect yourself if there's a dispute or a disagreement later on about what your agreement was. Always, always best to get it in writing. Contract law is a function of state law. So normally, that would mean that we have 50 different sets of laws to worry about when we're entering into contracts in the business world especially if a business does business across state lines, which almost all businesses do now. If we had to worry about uh, the contract laws in 50 different states, that would be pretty problematic. So one way that the states have simplified that are that they've all gone and adopted the exact same set of laws when it comes to contracts for the sale of goods. That way, we've kind of standardized from state to state what the laws are with respect to contracts and how that's going to work. That set of standardized laws is called the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC. UCC, again, applies to contracts for the sale of goods in the business context for over $500. That's going to cover an awful lot of the contracts that you encounter in the business world. The UCC is long, it's complex, it's dense, it's technical, and it's a little bit more than what we're going to get into in this class. We only have two weeks to spend on contracts. The UCC would be a whole semester. So I do want you to know that uh, if you are engaged in a business where you are selling goods, that are over $500, there is a set, a uniform set of laws from state to state that's the same that governs things like whether your contracts have to be in writing, um, what kind of contracts require um, a certain due diligence period, what are the recourse for someone if the contract is breached for merchants, very specific to issues surrounding the sale of goods. Again, not going to test you on anything UCC related because we're not necessarily diving into that these two weeks. Another overarching idea that I want you to be familiar with as we talk about contracts is that the whole idea of whether a contract exists, that really means whether or not there's an agreement that can be enforced in court. The definition of a contract that I want us to use is an agreement that can be enforced in court. 
Remember how when we were talking in torts about things that where uh, we might commit torts or we might commit crimes, but nobody's going to go through the trouble of actually enforcing the law against us in court. I might push Brandon after class, and that under the law is an assault and possibly even a battery, um, or a battery and possibly even an assault, but he might not go through the trouble of actually suing me for it. Same kind of thing in contracts. The main thing you need to be worried about is, can this be enforced in court? And think about that from both sides of the coin. If I'm dealing with somebody and we're trying to come to an agreement on something, I need to be worried about what I can enforce them to do in court and what they could enforce against me in court. Okay, So that's really where we're thinking about, we're going with our overall thinking of contracts. The last kind of overall principle I'll say before we get into it is um, that when we're looking at assessing the legality of a contract, whether or not a contract exists, we are going to look at objective facts and evidence as opposed to what somebody thought in their mind or what they meant. So when a court looks at intent, they're looking at things like what the party said, what they wrote, how they acted or appeared, the circumstances surrounding the transaction. You know, if if I so for example, if um, if if Brandon and I enter into a contract for him to buy my house, and we do it at a real estate agent's office and we have pages and pages of emails of our negotiations and then we get to the end and I claim that I was I was just kidding okay that I never really intended to sell in my house and he knew that he knew I was just kidding the court is going to not look at they can't look at what is in my mind they're going to look at what I said what I wrote what I did where we did this On the other hand, if Brandon and I meet up at a nightclub downtown on a Friday night at midnight and we start talking about me selling him my house and I write down on a bar napkin, I'll sell you my house for X amount and he says, I agree and signs his name to it. And then later on I say, well, I, I was drunk out of my mind and he, he knew I was, okay? The court is still not going to be able to get in my mind, but they're going to look at things like what I say, what the writing was, the circumstances surrounding our agreement. We were in a bar at midnight on a Friday night. That's not normally where serious real estate transactions go down, right? So the objective theory of contracts wants us to look at objective evidence when we're evaluating what a person's intent was. There are four big elements of a contract, and we're going to break them down this way. We're going to do the first two this week and the second two next week. So the ones we're looking at this week, well, let me tell you all four to begin with. Four elements of a contract are agreement, consideration, capacity, and legality. Today we're going to do agreement and consideration. Just to give you an overall real quick flavor, agreement just means exactly what you think it is. There has to be an offer, there has to be an acceptance, and the parties have to be um, have the same understanding about what each party's responsibility is under the contract. Consideration means that each party has to give up something of value to the other. Otherwise, it's just a gift. If I give Asia a thousand dollars this morning, I just hand her a check for a thousand dollars. We've never talked about it. I just do it, and then next week I'm like, "Hey, you gotta um, now you have to come work for me um, for a year." Uh, that's not there was no consideration given at the time that I gave her the money. She didn't give me anything that was a gift. 
capacity means did, did I have um, the capacity to make a contract? Am I a minor or am I of age to enter into a contract? Did I have sound mind? Was I too drunk to get in to make a contract or appreciate what I was doing? That's capacity. And then legality is that um, the subject matter of a contract has to be legal. So uh, if I enter into a contract or an agreement with my cocaine dealer for me to distribute uh, his product on the streets of Columbus and then he doesn't pay me, um, we don't have a we don't have an enforceable contract because our subject matter wasn't legal. So agreement, consideration, capacity, and legality. Today we're going to do agreement and consideration. So let's start with agreement. You'll find that on, I think, page four of your outline under section two. So there has to be an offer and there has to be an acceptance. We're going to break down offer into some smaller parts. An offer is a promise to do something or to refrain from doing something in the future. I will pay you $5 if you give me a ride home. I will, I was about to say I'll give you an A if you give me $50, but that's illegal. So that would not be a valid offer. Um, I will give you Five dollars if you sell me that bunch of bananas. I will pay my Uber driver in exchange for the ride home. A promise to do something or not to do something in the future. An offer has to be serious. Now, it has to have serious intent. So if I tell Asia, uh, if you give me five dollars, I will fly you to the moon after class. That's not serious because that's no reasonable person would expect that I could fly them to the moon. So it has to be serious intent. What is not, it's easier kind of to look at the things that are not serious intent. Here are the things that don't constitute serious intent. Opinion. That cross necklace you're wearing looks like it's worth $15,000. $15,000. She can't then come up to me and say, deal, sell it to you for $15,000. I'm just expressing an opinion. Boy, that's a nice farm you've got, Brandon. I'd be, I'd be willing to pay top dollar for that. Or I think that farm, I think your farm could bring a million dollars on the open market. You can't then come up to me and say, deal, you owe me the million. That's an opinion. Statements of future intent are not offers. Professor Tebow, would you sell your, are you thinking about selling your farm? Yeah, uh, we're going to put our, we're going to put it on the market next year for probably somewhere around a million dollars. That's not an offer. That's a statement of future intent. There was a guy at breakfast a couple weeks ago. I drive a 2014 Toyota. And he said, I think you could get $30,000 for that car. And I said, deal. I sell it to you for $30,000 right now because I know I can't get that. Um, That was not... I mean, that was a, a statement of future. Well, I mean, that wasn't a statement of future intent, but that was not exhibiting a, a series. That was an ex- expression of opinion. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble using my words this morning. Preliminary negotiations are not an offer. Hey, Tebow, you thinking about selling that car? I am. I'm just not sure what I want for it yet. What are you thinking you're going to ask? I may ask, I don't know, somewhere between twenty-five and $30,000. Um, I might be willing to pay that. If I did that, would you uh, throw in a new set of tires? I might do that, or I might buy an extended warranty. Uh, those are preliminary negotiations. Those are not a, de- a definite offer. 
you've heard of, um, you have to be very careful about preliminary negotiations. Because just because you call something preliminary negotiations doesn't mean that you didn't actually make an offer. Okay? Um, you've heard of letters of intent or agreements to agree. Some people will enter into a, um, a letter of intent, meaning that they're both intending to uh, follow that up with a formal contract that they're going to flesh out maybe some more details on or something, but they want to go ahead and lock up uh, each other's obligation. Those can be enforceable as contracts. We're not really getting into the weeds of when they can and can't, but uh, the point being for you is that you just need to be very careful that just by saying something was negotiations or uh, just preliminary and uh, does not necessarily mean it wasn't a definite offer. Because again, if we disagree about it, we go to court, the jury is going to listen to what your words were and what your writings were, what the circumstances were. And if a reasonable person would have concluded that you were not preliminary negotiations, you were making an offer, then they might find, they might find that you have a binding contract. So just what you label something doesn't necessarily mean that um, that's how a jury or a judge would interpret it. Um, an offer has to be reasonably certain or definite in its terms so that if there's a dispute, the judge or the jury can then figure out what it was that your offer was. If we can't figure out, if, if, if a reasonable person can't figure out what the offer even meant, that's not an offer. Hey, I'll give you good money for that necklace. That, that, does, that doesn't spell out who's going to buy it, who's selling it, how much the payment is, when the payment's going to be made, what the terms are, how long the, you have to pay. All these type of things, have to, we have to have some concrete details within the offer so that if there's a dispute about it, we could sort it out. Otherwise, it's not an offer. We're going to spell out not just, um, well, let's, let's take that another step further. I'm going to, um, uh, uh, you asked me if I'll sell you my farm. I say, I'll sell you my farm. Um, for market price, deal, we shake on it, or we put it in writing, because it involves a sale of land. Was that a definite offer? We, did, we haven't said, maybe I own the, the farm with my brother. Maybe the person that is going to buy it is a group of people, a consortium of investors. Maybe my farm as you understand it, is not the same farm as I understand it. Maybe it's three parcels that I inherited from my parents. And the farm is the one that I consider the pasture, not the house, the parcel with the house. But you, you think the farm means everything. Again, going back to my point from the beginning of class, if you're negotiating something, put it in right. So the farm might not be definite enough for us to determine exactly what it is that I'm selling and you're buying. Market price. That's not really a definite expression of what the consideration is going to be. So an offer has to be definite enough for us to determine what it was objectively that the intent of the parties was. Your outline says an offer also has to be communicated to the offeree, the person offers being made to. And that is true. And that sounds a little funny at first because you're like, well, of course, uh, you can't accept an offer if I never communicated it to you. But uh, what we really mean on that is if I say, Asia, I'll sell you my farm for a million dollars. Brandon can't come up and bring me a check for a million dollars and say, I accept your offer. I didn't communicate it to him. I communicated it to you. If I said, I will sell my farm to the first person who brings me a check for a million dollars, then anybody could accept that. 
So it has to be communicated to the offeree. Offers can also be terminated before they're accepted. That would be called revoking the offer, revocation of the offer. If I say that I'll sell you my farm for a million dollars, uh, and then Thursday I come into class and tell you that I have changed my mind, um, that offer is revoked. You can't then and you can't then bring me a check for a million dollars and say we had a contract and sue me for it. You can't enforce that in court because I revoked the offer when I took it back. You can do take backs in contract law. Okay. Um, if I told you that I would sell you my farm for a million dollars and then tomorrow uh, I sell it to somebody else and we come in Thursday and you bring me the check for a million dollars, the offer has been terminated because I've already sold it to somebody else. If I tell you I'm going to sell you a horse and if you bring me the check on Thursday, you can have the horse, and tonight the horse dies, the offer is terminated. If the subject matter of the, of the offer is destroyed, then the offer is terminated. Now there is a way to... Well, let me keep going for a second before I get there. An offer could also terminate if it's specified in the offer. I will um, sell you my farm if you bring me a check for a million dollars within five days. Five days pass, you don't bring me the check for a million dollars, the offer terminates by its terms. If you and I agree that I'll sell you my farm for the express purpose of you building an apart apartment building on it, and then next week, the county or the city passes an ordinance that changes the zoning to where that my farm can no longer ever be developed into apartments, then my offer will be terminated because it's impossible to follow through with that anymore. That's another way that an offer would be terminated. If an offer is rejected, it's terminated. So I tell you, I'll sell you my farm for a million dollars, and you say, no way. You can't come back Thursday at class with a check for a million dollars and claim that I'm bound to sell it to you. Rejection terminates an offer. Here's something else that terminates an offer. A counteroffer. I tell you I'll sell you my farm for a million dollars and you say I'll give you 900,000 for it and I say no then you can't turn around and say okay I accept your offer of a million that offer has been terminated when you made a counter offer again hopefully you're seeing that this is another reason to do this stuff in writing if you go to court and all you have is what I remember I said, or what I claim I said, and what I claim you said, and vice versa, it's going to be pretty hard for a court to enforce anything. Hopefully, we would have had witnesses if we did everything orally, but not always the case. Yes? You can't take it back once it's been accepted. You can take it back to any time. You can take it back um, any time up into acceptance. Even if I tell you I will leave it open for ten days, I could come back tomorrow and say I take it back. There is a, there is one way around that, and that is if the offeree pays or gives some consideration for the offer staying open. You see this in real estate contracts. It's called an option. The offer is made and the offeror says, I'll leave it open for 30, you have 30 days to accept. And um, the offeree pays them to keep it open for 30 days. 
then they can't take it back during the 30 days. Because the offeree has given up something of value in exchange for that. Really, if we want to get super technical on that, the contract they've made is to keep the contract open for 30 days. That's what the exchange was. But that's the only time you really can't take an offer back. Acceptance is the mirror image of offer, obviously. And usually acceptance is going to be made in the manner that the offer was given, although it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, But if I make an offer in writing to you, you can accept it verbally, but most of the time I'm going to want you to sign something in writing as well, showing that you've accepted it. Or more importantly, you're going to want to do that in writing so that you have something to prove that you accepted it. Courts are generally looking for the uh, the acceptance to be in the same form as the offer. Silence is generally not acceptance. Silence by itself is not generally acceptance. I offer to sell you my farm for a million dollars, you don't respond in any way, either verbally or body language or in writing, I can't then sue you, take you to court and say that you accepted my offer by silence because I said, hey, Brandon, I'm going to sell you my farm for a million dollars and if you don't say anything, you've accepted. That's not how it works. Silent, however, silence plus action could be acceptance. Not always, but could be. Here's an example. Brandon, I give you $50 if you mow my lawn after class today. He just gave me thumbs up. He said nothing, but he gave me a thumbs up. If we're in front of the jury, um, I would argue that a reasonable person in my situation would understand that a thumbs up means I agree. But even better than that, let's say he leaves class and goes to my house and mows my lawn. He didn't give me a thumbs up. He didn't shake his head. He did nothing. He just did it. He was silent as to his his acceptance, but his actions indicated. I mean, a reasonable person would understand that he has accepted my offer. So silence in and of itself, usually not acceptance, but silence plus some actions might be acceptance. We used to have this thing called the mailbox rule. I'm not, I'm not testing y'all on this, but it, it's just funny to me as an old person how times have changed. But we used to have to worry about timing when stuff was mailed because that's how everything, that's how the business was done and those communications were made. If they weren't hand-delivered, it was mailed. So if I wanted to revoke an offer, I would need to, you know, communicate that to you. And if you want to accept or you signed a contract, you you might put something in the mail to me. And our mail could cross. I might tell you that I've changed my mind, but you have already accepted in the mail. We used to have this rule about once you put it in the mail, it's done. But we don't, I I can't even, I mean, I, I can see where it would come up these days, but I mean, almost all of our Business communication is done via email. Um, I know like in, in my legal practice, when we are settling, when we're negotiating to settle cases, um, we put it in writing, obviously, so we know exactly what we're agreeing to. Um, but we do that over email. And if we have a deal, I will email, we agree. So the mailbox rule doesn't necessarily... I guess the mailbox rule, if we extended it today, would apply to when I hit send. (laughs) Not necessarily... Oh, I guess that's true. If I've... Actually, I think about it. If if, If I emailed, we have a deal. And then you call me up later that night and they're like, well, I did. I changed my mind. I haven't seen that email yet. The mailbox rule would mean that my acceptance was good when I sent it.
the second element that we want to talk about is consideration. Consideration is the value that is given in exchange for the promise from the other party. Consideration has to be given on both sides in order for this element to be met. Otherwise, it's a gift. So each party has to be giving up something of value or refraining from doing something that they have the legal right to do. Next week we're going to talk about things that might negate consideration um, if something wasn't voluntary or bargained for. Maybe there was duress or incapacity or undue influence or something like that. But the court wants to make sure that there was a bargain for exchange, that the, um, each party understood what they were doing and knowingly and willingly agreed to what they were doing. Now, be very careful about this. The court does want to make sure that the exchange was bargained for. But the court is not going to get into whether or not it was a good bargain. Whether or not the parties made a good deal or a bad deal. We are free. We have the free will and the right under the law in this country to make whatever deals we want. And if we regret it later, or it turns out to be a bad deal, the courts are not going to step in and rescue us from that. Reason being, uh, if they did, then all we would have to do to get out of contracts is just claim it was a bad deal. Or we could use the courts to sort of weaponize our business dealings and our contract negotiations. I'll give you an example. Um, I have a horse that's worth $10,000. But I also owe my bookie $1,000 from a bet I lost on football over the weekend. And he says if I don't pay him today, he's going to break my legs. And I believe that because it's happened before. So I'm like, hey, Asia, you want to buy my horse? I got this prize horse worth $10,000. I'd give it to you for 1000 And you're like, deal. Let's do it. And then I end up finding the money for my bookie from somewhere else, and I decide I don't want to sell you that horse for 1000 That's a terrible deal. Too bad. That's a deal. I wanted the $1,000 for it when I made it, didn't I? I did. That's the deal I made. It was bargained for. I was willing to sell it for a thousand. You were willing to give give me a thousand. So the courts are usually not going to get into the adequacy of consideration. Here are some examples of agreements that lack consideration. Almost all the the, the things we do on a daily basis um, constitute consideration. I mean, I'm I'm the Uber driver's giving me a ride. I'm giving them whatever it costs. I'm going to buy, I bought this Coke at the uh, my breakfast place this morning and um, I gave them money for it. Consideration was a Coke for money, a ride for money. Um, I'm going to give Brandon a ride home today after class in exchange for him mowing my lawn. No money's exchanged hands, but we have a promise for a promise. I gave him a ride, he mowed my lawn. Bad deal for him. But agreements that lack consideration are those that involve um, a pre-existing duty, for example. That's one instance. You can't make a contract, or the consideration for a contract can't be something that a person is already bound to do. So the example for that is, I have a contract with Columbus State to teach four classes this semester. I can't call up Dean Kidder Thursday morning and say, unless you pay me $10,000 more, I'm not going to teach any more of my classes. And she says, 
uh, okay, I'll do it. I will pay you 10000 more. We get to the end of the semester. She doesn't do it. I sue her. Her defense would be, Tom did not provide any consideration in exchange for that $10,000 because he was already legally bound to teach the class. So things we're already bound or required to do cannot be consideration. Same thing goes for things that we have done in the past. Uh, I give Brandon a ride home from class today because he asks for it. I don't ask him for anything in return. And then tomorrow I send him an invoice for $500 for the ride. He won't pay it. I sue him. And I claim that um, the consideration that I provided was the ride. Well, that, that already happened. There was no deal before that. He didn't give me or promise to give me anything before I gave him the ride. So past consideration does not support a future contract. Another example is of a contract that lacks consideration is something that's illusory. Um, if a contract is so vague or it's uncertain about performance that the promisor has not really promised to do anything, it's so ambiguous that it could be termed illusory. An example of that would be, um, I tell my uh, employees that I'm going to give them a Huge bonus uh, at the end of the year if um, if I'm satisfied with their performance. That's that's illusory. There's really no there. I haven't really promised to do anything. They're already they're bound to work. I'm bound to pay them. That's not a great example. Um, if I tell them I'm going to give them big bonuses if we have a good year. There's some other problems with that offer, with that as well. I, that, there's, I, would, I would argue there's not any definite, enough definiteness in the offer for us to even determine what it is I've promised to do. But the performance is just so uncertain. Um, if you give me, or if you... Uh, you give me a ride home after class, I'll make it worth your while. Illusory. We don't, we don't exactly, there's no way to sort of, there's no way to know what it is I'm promising to do. Illusory promises. There is, um, kind of an exception to the situation I was talking about with the pre-existing duty where, uh, where I said that couldn't be consideration if we were already legally bound or obligated to do it. Let me use a different example on this. Let's say that I, I have a construction company and I'm going to build a new dorm for CSU and we enter into a contract where they hire me to do it. It's a valid contract. We get halfway through it and we find out that um, unbeknownst to either of us, there is several tons of toxic waste on the building site that no one knew about. And it's gonna cost, it's gonna triple the cost of the project to remediate all of that. I might go to CSU and say, hey, uh, I'm gonna need another million dollars to fulfill my obligations and it is because now I'm going to have to deal with this waste. They say, that's fine. We get to the end. They don't pay me the million. We go to court and they say, he was already obligated to build the dorm. So he didn't give us any new consideration. If there's an unforeseen difficulty that might allow me 
to get around that. In other words, yeah, the deal we had did not contemplate at all there being toxic waste to the point that it was going to triple the cost of the job. Well, would it, the question is, would it add to the consideration? I mean, yes, and I mean, I would say no in that I'm obligated to build the dorm on that site. That's what I'm contra contractually promised to do. So just because it's going to cost me more to build it might not necessarily get me, me uh, require new consideration on their part or consideration on my part. I think I've confused everybody on this. Um, unforeseen difficulties usually do allow the parties some wiggle room on that. Now, if I agreed to build a new dorm and um, turns out that prices of materials just went up a whole lot more than I expected, or I get out there and decide that this dirt is really a lot harder than I thought it was. And it's going to take me longer to do the digging and the foundation prep. And I go back to CSU and try to get more money from them. There's no new consideration on my part. Those are, for, those are difficulties that are risks that somebody would normally assume. Materials might go up. It might be a little more harder than I thought. That's not the same as encountering... Um, toxic waste that no one thought was going to be there. So unforeseen difficulties might be a way to get around that. If we don't have consideration, then we don't have a contract. If we don't have a contract, then we don't have something that's enforceable in court. There is a way around consideration. when it comes to enforcing somebody's promise in court. It's not done through contract, because again, you can't have a contract without consideration. But it's done under something called promissory estoppel. You see this in your it's the very last topic in this part of the outline. Promissory estoppel sometimes you can think of as a substitute for consideration. The best way to describe it is for me to give you the example before we go through the elements. Let's say that I um, am a rich philanthropist, of which I am neither, and I agree or I tell the Boys and Girls Club of Columbus that I'm going to give them $5 million for a new facility. And this is the result of uh, months of meeting and planning and discussion. Uh, we, f we finalize, um, or I, I write them a letter saying, this is, I'm, I'm going to give you this gift. And uh, we have a big ceremony. We get one of them big giant checks, you know, and I'm going to hand it to them and all that. And then um, I decide that I don't want to give them five million dollars anymore. They can't sue me in court under contract because we lack consideration. They didn't give me anything in exchange for my promise to pay them five million. So we can't do it in contract. Is there another way that they could hold me to my promise? Yes, under promissory estoppel. These are the things that have to be met for that. It has to be a clear and definite promise. In my example, I sent them a letter. All the officials were involved. It was months of uh, discussions leading up to it. It's pretty clear that I was going to give them $5 million for the purpose of them constructing a new facility or whatever it is. Now, if I'm playing golf with the director of the Boys and Girls Club, who's a friend of mine, and we're just out there, and they're like, you know, I, we really need a new facility. And I'm like, yeah, I would, yeah, I'll give you $5 million for that. 
And then we don't think anything about it. A couple weeks later, he calls me up and is like, hey, when are you sending over that $5 million? I tell him I'm, I'm not going to do that. Changed my mind or I wasn't really serious. He can't sue me under the theory of promissory estoppel. I didn't necessarily, I mean, I, I guess you could maybe say, I don't know that you could say that was a clear and definite promise. But that kind of bleeds into the second element. There has to be a reasonable expectation that the person is going to rely on the promise. If I meet with the executive team of the Boys and Girls Club and my lawyers and accountants over a period of a year leading up to me deciding to give them this gift, pretty reasonable that I think they're relying on it. I think they think I'm serious. If I'm playing golf with my buddy and he just mentions that I need a new facility and I tell him I'd do, I would probably give him $5 million for it, is that reasonable for him to rely on that? We're friends and we're playing golf. We're not having this discussion in the context of regular business. Maybe I am a homeless person who lives under a bridge and I show up at the Boys and Girls Club and I'm like, hey, I've got this letter. I'd like to give it to you. I'm promising to give you $5 million for your new building. Is it reasonable that they're going to rely on that? Maybe not if they know that I'm a homeless person who lives under the They know I don't have $5 million. So again, the context is matter. Um, the promisee has to actually rely on the promise. So if I, let's go back to the first example where I made a serious promise to give them the money. And in response to my promise, the Boys and Girls Club goes out and buys a parcel of land, hires an architectural firm to design the new building, hires a contractor to begin the work on the building, and then I call up and tell them that I've decided not to make the gift. They sue me. They'd have to meet all these elements. They could show that they actually relied on the promise by doing those things. If we have that big ceremony and I hand them the big paper check, and then the next day I say, I have, I've changed my mind. And they haven't done anything in reliance on my promise. Then I'm off the hook. They have, they have to have relied on my promise to their detriment. The detriment would be the money they spent on the new site, the money they spent on the contractor and the architect and that kind of thing. And then the final element is really the kind of the most important one. That the only way for justice to be served is to make me follow through on my promise. If I promise to give CSU $5 million to build a new dorm, I, I got to sneeze. It passed. Um, and they go and buy... We have a ceremony and all this thing. They go and buy the land and they hire a contractor and they have an architect. And then I change my mind. I made a clear and definite promise. I, I, it was reasonable that they could rely on it. They actually did rely on it to their detriment. But is the only way to serve justice to make me go through with my gift? My argument, would, their argument would be yes. We're a public institution. He promised to give us this money and, and it was very reasonable for us to go out there and do all these things to rely on it. My argument would be justice, the only way to serve justice, sorry. It's not, enforcing the promise is not the only way to do justice here. They are a state-funded institution. They have plenty of money. They've got money for that from somewhere else. They were going to build that dorm whether I gave them the money or not. Um, that would be my argument, that justice could still be served without enforcing it. The Boys and Girls Club, on the other hand, different set of facts. 